this takes us to our last, finally, right? Our last macromolecule. We're going to talk about nucleic acids. Uh, nucleic acids, you can think of these as the blueprint of life, right? Sometimes people will call it the like blueprint for all the proteins or the cookbook for everything, right? Uh, so nucleic acids are fundamental molecules that store and transmit genetic information within living organisms. Uh, they play a central role in the inheritance of traits and, and the functioning of cells. Now, I, I do want to also point out there are some other functions of nucleic acids that are, some of them are, are actually quite new, our understanding of them. Things like um, RNA interfering, small little RNAs um, that are a part of uh well, part of the immune system in some organisms that will destroy, say, viruses or things like that. Really neat, uh, maybe a topic that we'll get to talk about a little bit later in the semester. All right, so major functions of nucleic acids. We've got uh, genetic storage and inheritance, very, very important, right? Major, major function. DNA carries the genetic code that determines an organism's traits, okay? So everything that makes up you is encoded in your, your DNA. Uh, this includes general characteristics, hair color, eye color, uh, but also developmental processes. So the way in which you, you know, at what age did puberty start? Uh, at what age will menopause start if you're female? Um, it's a huge range of processes. The when you grow versus when you stop growing kind of stuff. Um, when cells divide, right, DNA is replicated. And to ensure that it's passed on to the next generation, we have a whole slew of proteins that help make sure it gets copied properly. Uh, protein synthesis. So, right, DNA stores that information, but we've got to be able to turn that, you know, stored information into something usable, proteins. Um, so that information is stored in the DNA. It gets transcribed into something called mRNA, okay, which is then used to be translated into protein. And we'll, we'll talk about it in more detail in later chapters. Uh, and then cellular regulation. So your DNA, it's not just a big cookbook for the proteins, but it also involves huge chunks of DNA that their whole role is determining when the different proteins get made or not made, um, or in what cells certain proteins are, we call it expressed. Uh, some cells are going to express certain things and not others, right? You have different tissues. Your cells are different throughout your body. Regulation is how that happens. Uh, all right. So there are two types of nucleic acid. There's deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA, and ribonucleic acid, RNA. Uh, DNA is the genetic material. It carries that hereditary information uh, for the organism. It's kept in the nucleus if you are eukaryotic, but it can just be free in the cytoplasm if you are prokaryotic. Uh, it's often depicted as a ladder or the double helix. We'll look at that in a couple slides. Or next slide. Uh, the rungs of the ladder are formed by complementary pairs of nitrogenous bases, um, A with T, C with G. Uh, these pairs kind of hooked together, right? Uh, ensure that the replication of DNA is done properly. All right, uh, RNA serves as the bridge between the genetic information stored in DNA and the synthesis of proteins. Uh, unlike DNA, RNA is typically single-stranded um, and can have several different structures. Um, there's three main types of RNA. There's messenger RNA, which we already mentioned, right? That's what's gonna be used to, um, as the directions for forming a protein. We have transfer RNA and then ribosomal RNA. And they both play, transfer and ribosomal RNA, play important roles in uh, protein synthesis. The mRNA carries the instructions, and then the cellular machine, or carries the instructions from DNA to the cellular machinery that produces the proteins, which ribosomes. Um, tRNA, that's gonna bring the specific, that's your, your um, transfer RNA. It's gonna bring specific amino acids to the ribosome, rRNA, uh, during protein synthesis. And then the rRNA is that those components, you know, you've seen the images, it's like they attach to the DNA and then go across and make the protein. We'll, we'll get into it a lot more later. All right, the double helix. So the double helix, 
this is an iconic structure, right? Um, it's the genetic material that holds the instructions for an entire living organism. Um, imagine you know, it's this twisted ladder um, with long strands spiraling around each other, and then they even they coil down. And it's, it's very complex and, and beautiful. If you know, if you find that sort of thing beautiful, um, the structure was technically discovered by Rosalind Franklin but identified by James Watson and Francis Crick in 1953. She took the, the pictures, the images um, necessary to discover the structure uh, and she had actually hadn't finished her analysis yet. They beat her to it using her pictures. Um, unethical is uh, the word I would use, um, but it was a different time. Uh, if you ever get the chance to read about Rosalind Franklin, very, very much worth, uh, worth your time. Um, Let's see, so that was, that was 1953. Interestingly, before 1953, there was a huge debate among scientists about what held the genetic material. Was it in the form of protein? Could it be DNA? They actually didn't think it was DNA. They were more inclined to think it was mRNA or, or in proteins than, than DNA. Um, so that's, that's kind of fun. Uh, there was actually kind of a, war is way too strong of a word, but uh, kind of, rivalries about it, uh, especially across uh, from the United States and uh, Europe. There was these kind of rivalries about the whole thing. Um, all right, so the structure of the double helix, uh, it's made up of these two long chains, right, um, that are composed of nucleotides, DNA, so deoxyribonucleic acids, each one, so A, T, C, and G. Um, and they're going to be called base pairing, so A to T, C to G. And you can see, right, there's this little bit of space. It uses hydrogen bonding to make that connection. This is really important. If it was covalently bonded, if the two strands were covalently bonded to each other, it would be very difficult and require a lot of energy to separate them when it came time to make copies. So the backbones, each individual strand, that is covalent bonding, but the two strands are held together by hydrogen bonding. And this allows for them to more easily unfold and then fold back. It doesn't require a bunch of energy to do either one. All right. So we made it. <laughs> uh, that was a long section. I know that was a lot of information to take in, uh, but you know, chemistry sets the foundation for understanding biology. And in fact, it's so fundamental to biology that just to kind of give you a feel for that when I when I earned my bachelor's degree uh, I was only one course shy of earning a minor in chemistry and I, I've always regretted not taking that one last class um, but it didn't fit in my schedule that last semester so that's how it goes um, but that's that's how important chemistry is to understanding the fundamentals of biology you you really have to have a strong base so that's why we spent so much time on this um, great job for sticking with it and up next, we're gonna actually start looking at cells. So I will see you all in the next chapter.